back. I, I'm a fourth generation BC uh, resident, you could say, or second generation, depending on how you count it. My great grandfather came here to help build the railroad. Um, my grandfather and his brothers came, but they came alone. They left their wives and children in China. And so really, my parents only came in 1964, 65. And I was born in 1967. And so you could say I'm a fourth generation, or you could say I'm a second generation. And that kind of slippage is precisely because of the history of the Chinese in Canada and the anti-Chinese legislation and racism that led to things like the head tax and the Chinese exclusion in 1923. So when I was in high school growing up here, I wasn't a big fan of history. In fact, I hated history. You know, I, when I was taking History 12, it was like endless dates of this treaty signed and that, and it just seemed this inexorable tide of you know, what people were doing in Europe and then what they were doing when they came here. And everybody else was either on the margins or just sort of like, and by the way, there was some Chinese mining. Anyways, back to the real story. And so one of the things that I think was inspiring about the work of people like Gene Barman was, Gene was saying, no, there was a lot of other people already here, First Nations and Aboriginal peoples, and they didn't go away. They kept surviving, and to this day, they're still here. And there were other people who helped build a railroad, who, who in fact were often here before the majority of European migrants came. That's why they built the railroad, so that they could build the transportation that would bring most Europeans to the West Coast. It was very difficult to get here from Europe before that. So, what I, <laughs> why I wanted to go into that sort of long um, uh, tangent was to suggest that I only became a historian because there was a possibility of thinking about history in a different way. Not in two different ways. One was that history is broader than the history that I learned in high school, and that it was more interesting as a broader history that included everyone who was here, and the conflicts, and the kinds of bad things that happened, but also not just what was done to people like Chinese and Aboriginal peoples, but what, were, what they were doing themselves. So, okay, so don't bother with the textbooks. I hated textbooks, hated dates. So why should I write a textbook and bore the heck out of 18 and 17 year olds uh, and 22 year olds in, in my own classes at UBC? So one of the things was, let's use technology. Um, and so one of the things that happened is because of decades and decades of struggles for redress for the head tax, for apology for redress, and there are quite a few of the activists here in the room today who fought for a long time, there was an apology in 2006 and there was a fund set up to document and create historical learning resources. And so we were very lucky to, at UBC and SFU, create a little project where we were gonna use new technologies to try to create the most access to those histories. And so that's what turned into the Chinese Canadian Stories Project. And it was going to create a website, and it's done, so you can go to it, um, which was trilingual in English, French, the two official languages of Canada, but also Chinese. And we thought that was important because that was the original language of the people who came. And in fact, we really wanted to honor that kind of tie to the migrants themselves. So it's a trilingual website. We also wanted to, in fact, use what we call the, the irony of discrimination, which is the Chinese were unwanted which meant that there was a lot of records kept of every single one of them came. Did they pay the head tax? So there's a head tax registry with 97,123 entries, 97,123 entries, with 14 columns of information, what village they came from, how tall they were, whether they had scars on their face. If you came from Scotland and got off in the same period in Halifax, there would be virtually no record of you because you're welcome. Get off the boat, come on in. If you're Chinese, it's like, we want to know everything about you so that we can make sure you're not like trying to get around paying the head tax and all that kind of stuff. So the irony is, that gives a lot, a lot of records for us to use. And so I had three students uh, spend 18 months data entering, reading that horrible handwriting, and data entering everything to create a head tax database. And that allowed us to map 
for instance, about a third of their destinations between 1910 and 1923. Now, I want you to take a very careful look at that map. We think of the Chinese as being in Vancouver and Victoria, in Chinatowns. This is actually where they were, in every single small town across Canada, all the way through the Maritimes. The only reason Newfoundland is blank is because they weren't part of Canada yet. And the Chinese did go to Newfoundland as well, and they paid a head tax there as well. So what this map, we, I hope, does is show you that the Chinese were an integral part of Canada all the way across, in every small town in the prairies, in every small town in the Maritimes and in central Canada, not just BC. Just in case you're thinking, well, maybe it was only one or two. Well, actually, this is a weighted spot map, which shows you, actually, there are quite a few people in Toronto. There are quite a few people in the major cities. Yes, they're owning restaurants, they're running laundries, and, but they're doing a lot of things, but they're there. Okay, so their presence through Canadian history is strong. So one of the things we wanted to do, trilingual site, I'll actually just let this play. Old photos, grainy black and white film. Who is in them? Who are they? What are their stories? For over two centuries, Chinese have been coming to Canada to work, to live, and to raise their families. Those old men in the photos, what dreams brought them to Canada? My name is Henry Yu. I was born in Vancouver in 1967, Canada's 100th birthday. The stories of the Chinese in Canada are still an uncommon history. So much has been forgotten, so much ignored. When I was in grade school, I learned about the racism and discrimination against the Chinese. But this project is not about what was done to the Chinese, but what they were doing. What will our children know about the place of Chinese Canadians in our history? What will they learn about those who paved the way for us? We're using the best technology to preserve the stories of Chinese Canadians. Students want to learn using the latest digital media, so we've worked with teachers to create resources that tell stories in new and powerful ways. We have held community workshops to work together with Chinese Canadians from across the country. In speaking with and listening to the stories of our elders, we are rediscovering our past and a sense of who we are. This project is about connecting young people with our past, to discover a passion for our history, and to allow them to create a sense of who we are. We still don't know enough about our uncommon histories. We need to create a common past so that together we can have a common future. So that film was made by one of my students. So the idea here is instead of me talking at students, like I'm talking at you today, <laughs> and boring them, to get them involved in actually making the knowledge. So making films. Because right now, you know, if you're young, You've got smartphones, you've got you know, digital cameras. You can create a short film with just the stuff you have on your body, literally, in any given day. And 30 years ago, it would have cost $30,000, $40,000, $50,000 to do a short film. And you can upload it to the internet and have it mass distributed, literally, and people are accessing it. So that's what we're trying to take advantage in terms of the technological possibilities at this moment, that often someone my age is not either aware of or not very good at doing. And so we want to take advantage of the fact that someone's younger, it's the air they breathe. So one of the things we want to do is to connect across generations. So we had workshops in Vancouver, and there's a cache of old letters that uh, was in the Yip Sang building, and it's in the Vancouver archives, but no one could read them because even though they're Chinese characters, they were written to capture an oral village dialect that some people still speak, but it's very difficult to decipher because they're using terms 
that aren't used anymore. And so we had a series of workshops to go through these letters with elders and literally go one character at a time and go, what's, what's going on in this letter? Now, strangely enough, we discovered that a lot of letters were about, if they were sent to China, it was like, you know, I'm doing fine, da, 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 I sent some money, what the heck are you doing with all this money? And then, um, and then the letters that come the other way, it's like, oh, we're doing fine, uh, we got your money, we're running out of money, we need more money. <laughs> so it was interesting, but very formulaic. Okay. I'm, I'm, of course, joking. Um, one of the things that we found also was that the Chinese had a name, strangely enough, that was different for every place. It was in Cantonese or Toisan dialect or whatever. So places like Winnipeg, well, they had a different name. And so one of the things we did was create a spot map with all these different names in Cantonese that they had for places. That sounds sort of like trivial. It's not. That's actually quite an achievement to find out historically what places were called in the original village dialects. We also had our students involved in filming and interviewing and doing oral histories with elders so that those stories were not going to be lost when they passed away. Because it's those stories that give flesh and give insight into what people are actually doing and living historically. Often the kind of paper trail and the photographic trail, you have things like a photo, it's like unidentified Chinese man, circa 1900, location unknown. Whereas in a family photo, people know who's in that family photo until they pass away. And then that family album is full of photos which are I don't know who that is. So, descent, so unless there's a capturing of who is in those photos, you're not going to get an idea. Okay. This, we also helped support, um, there was 29 different groups across the country that also received head tax redress funds. And one of our mandates was to help them when they had technological needs. So uh, I'll just show you one example. The Ottawa Chinese Community Services Center, um, they had a project where they did interviews with about 20 different families around the Ottawa area of Chinese Canadians. Denise Chong, the famous writer, Concubine's Children, was actually the, the, the interviewer. And so what we did was say, we'll help you in whatever way we can. We sent our film crew to help film, and then we also helped them in terms of designing uh, little technological stuff. So this is one thing I'll just quickly show you. 